And they talk about victory in Jesus. All right, let me take you let me take you in a different direction with that. How is a victorious Christian that believes in victory in Jesus supposed to relate to such things as, oh, let's have a fun one today. Let's have a discussion about, of all things, taxes. How many of you enjoy paying taxes? Oh, right? But the question really is, how is the Christian supposed to relate to the government? It's a question that's been out there for ages and eons and continues to operate. I've heard some doozies. I've heard some incredible discussions, even from Christian pulpits, about how Christians shouldn't pay taxes. And I've heard some elaborate, wild ones on how to get away without doing what everybody else is doing or how or to be involved with it. I've heard all the stories about the uh, the tax code is illegal and inappropriate, and, uh, and, and it, it isn't even, and then there's a pretty good elaborate story out there on during the First World War when they changed the tax code to be able to have actually an income tax, that that's illegal, so you don't have to be involved with it. And Like I say, we can get pretty weird when it comes to our explanations of why we adults can come up with reasons of why we shouldn't do what we need to do as much as a kid can. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen a little kid trying to explain to you why I know what mommy said to do it this way, but I did it that way? You know, you know what I mean? We adults can come up with them just as well. It's a question that actually was thrown to Jesus. It was thrown at Jesus. What about taxes? How do you deal with the issue of taxes? Would you look at the question with me? Take your Bibles. In the book of, in the book of Matthew... Matthew, Matthew's gospel, Jesus gets thrown the question, what about taxes? Now the question really, when it comes right down to it, it's Matthew 22. When the question is being asked, it really isn't even being asked about taxes. It's being asked to try to trap Jesus in, his, in what he's talking about. And taxes seems like a fun way to get into a controversy and see if you can tie him up in his... In, um, in, in his own words. That's what they're trying to do here. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15 and onwards. And the Pharisees went and they plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of, of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, nor do you, or do you, and you do not regard the person of men. Now we probably ought to straighten that one out a little bit. They are not saying, Jesus, you don't like people and you don't want anything to do with people. They're saying actually the opposite. They're saying, we get that you, do, you aren't playing the rank system with it, that you, bowed, that you put somebody up on pedestals and put them in a better situation. We know that you don't do that. They're complimenting him with a backhanded compliment to get at him with the, with the bottom side here. And so they said, here we go now. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, remember, the question is a good one because what in the world, why should somebody who believes that your kingdom is in heaven, believes in the God that believes your kingdom is in heaven, why would you be paying taxes to your earthly government? Now, remember, too, that these good folks that were asking him this question are under somebody else's authority, that is, the Romans are in charge. And they're not thrilled about the fact that the Romans are in charge, and they really don't like them at all. But yet, on the other hand, the question is, if Jesus would say, no, you don't need to pay taxes to the Romans, why then they're going to go running right to the Romans and say, this guy's trying to create anarchy. Uh, and if he does, then, well, why are you claiming the authority? You know, that's a trick question. Nasty question. Notice how Jesus answers it. What does he say to them? Um... He says, show me your money. They hand him a coin. Whose symbol is on it? They said, Caesar's. And what's his answer? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Hmm. By the way, remember now, the Romans are in charge in their part of the world in that time, and the Romans were not known for their great ethics. Notice the verse again. Does Jesus say, 
Render unto Caesars the things to Caesar, the things that are Caesars, as long as Caesar is ethically using your, the, the money the way you want him to. Does he say that? No. A little further. Romans. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Let every subject, let every, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For as an er, there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. The rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do not be unafraid. Uh, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have no have praise for the same. All right. Anybody ever here driving down the road, minding your own business, see a police officer, police car going by, and go, huh, huh? You ever done that? Now, why'd you do that? There, there isn't anybody here that would ever be... Um, trying to get there as fast as you can. There, there wouldn't ever be, ever, ever be anybody here that ever did that, would there? Uh-huh. And so when we just tootling along, minding our own business, and we see the police car and go, ah! And look to see what's going on. Have you, have you ever been in the position I have? I, I have that silly habit of driving down the road and get a little nervous when I see the, you know, the car there. And I've had it happen a couple of times where I'm, you know, driving along and go, ooh, and look at the speedometer and go, what am I worried about? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fine within the limit. What do I care if he's there? You ever done that? Huh? That's what he's saying. If you're within, what the, the, within the confines, what do you care if there's a police officer there? You'll be fine. He's a minister to you for good. But if you do evil, then be afraid. For he does the bear, bear the sword in vain. The next verse, verse 5. You must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Ooh, there's that word again. For they are God's minister, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Don't owe anybody anything except to love one another. And then he goes through, that's what the commandments are about, is love one another. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, do this, knowing the time that it is now high time to awaken out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Now, when did this get written? I'm not asking you the exact date, but... Is it fair to say this was written as far as we're concerned quite a while ago? Is that a fair thing to say? Can, can, we, can we all agree on that? It was written as far as our time quite a while ago. Well, if it was high time in the context of the closeness of the second coming of the Lord when it was written, wouldn't you say that would apply to our day as well? That it is high time now to be? The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly properly, and put on all the Lord Jesus Christ that make no provisions for the other stuff. Let's have our focus be on Jesus Christ, but with our focus being on Jesus Christ, let's put honor where it belongs, including even the issue of taxes. Now, what does that mean, actually, render to each? I've had several times, I've had many good people tell me, look, I don't want my tax receipt for my charitable giving. I don't want it. Because I don't give for my tax receipt. I give because I give to God, and so I don't want that to be part of my giving process. I want to give for this. And I can, you know, God bless them if that's their position. I think there's another side to the coin, too. My friend, 
Bert. Bert was born the same year as my dad. My dad had died young. We were in this church, and Bert was about the same age as what my dad would have been. Interesting character. Bert was one of those type A's of a type A. You know what type A personality is? Type A's are those ones that are the hard chargers, and they'll, they'll, they're going to do whatever and wherever. They're going to succeed, and they're going to accomplish, and they're going to take on the world. Those type A's. Bert was a type A of the type A's. He was one that could be, he was one of these guys, when he came out of school, he got his nursing degree, um, the, the, he and his wife got married, and they went off to a third world country, and he gave literally thousands, maybe even in the hundreds of thousands of shots in a third world country to um, uh, vaccinations and stuff in this third world country. He was there. He was going to take on the world and do. Uh, he was one that even his personality could just change and address things. His wife always wanted to be a teacher and Bert taught her into being a nurse, like talked her into being a nurse like he was. Uh, she was a nurse and involved with following him around the world all over the place doing things. He decided he got tired of being a nurse. So in a little later on in age, he went back to med school and become a doctor. That wasn't good enough either. He had to go back to school some more and get a, uh, um, a, a subspecialty within of a subspecialty. He was a hard charger. He decided one day, he came home and he said, Honey, if you and I are ever going to uh, gonna get to retirement, we're going to have to take care of it on our own. So he and his wife took care of their own retirement planning and stuff. Um, and when I knew him, they were in retirement. And he kept saying, Pastor, if you want to retire, you better take care of it on your own. Take care of it on your own. He even told me, he says, if you want to get your kids through school, buy this stock. Buy this stock. It'll put your kids through school. I mean, he just, okay. He was such a pers type A of the type A's that he, he said himself, he grieved later on for the way he treated his oldest kids because his first kids that were born, he uh, decided they were going to be type A's too. And you can imagine the discussion that created at home. I mean, he was a hard charger. And whenever we'd talk about taxes, he'd say, Pastor, I want you to know, I want my receipt. Okay. I want my receipt. I believe in paying my taxes and I will pay my share, but I don't want to pay one penny more. And I want my receipt. I give my, I give what I can to the Lord's work, and I want that receipt because anything I can get written off just gives me that much more to give to the Lord's work. That's what I want it for, and I want that receipt so that I can have more to give as far as being involved with the Lord's work. And then he'd go a little farther. He says, you know, those legislators, they don't give away tax credits just for the fun of giving it away. They've got it calculated that those tax credits are for the advantage of for something bigger. That's why they're giving away tax credits, because they're wanting something. They want money going to these charitable, charitable things because they want charities to do some of the things they don't have to fool with. He says, they're giving that money away for a purpose. Boy, he was kind of feisty. But his point was, a Christian needs to be loyal, including to the government, but not one thing more than what I need to, because I'm putting everything I can where my energy is, and my energy is in being for and about the Lord. And his coming. Bert. Bert was a character. I'll tell you one on him. His soft spot in his heart was for young people, for kids. His soft spot, his soft spot was for Adventist Christian education. Okay? And he, I, I remember one time, he says, 
he would come to me, he would come to the pastor. It was supposed to be a big secret. Of course it wasn't, you know, Bert was, but it was supposed to be this big secret. I, I want to, I want, I got a little, got a little extra back. I want to give a little more to the, to tuition assistance. I said, okay. And he'd say, now, I want you to take care of this for me. I'd say, okay. And he'd tell me the same story every time. He says, now, I want you to know something. I want you to know something. You know, got that finger, you know. I want you to know something. I know the laws. And I know I can't tell you where to put that money. See, when you designate, then it's not charitable contribution anymore. Okay? Can't do that. Bert says, now I know the laws. I've checked this out. And I know that I can't tell you where to, how to distribute when I put this money in. Or it's not tax deductible, and I want my deduction because I don't want to pay one more month than I have to. Yep, yep, yep. I got so I knew the speech. I knew where it was going every time. Tell the same story. Now, he says, I know I can't tell you that when I give it, the committee that decides where that money's go can do whatever it wants to do with it. And I have nothing to say about it. But I want to tell you something, Pastor. I will have some suggestions for the committee. <laughs> and I know that my suggestions don't have to mean anything. The committee can do whatever it wants to, but I want you to know something. If the committee does not follow along the things that my suggestions might be, they will not have to worry about what to do with the money next year. That was what, you know? Be subject. Not only because of wrath, but for conscience sake. But the focus for the Christian is about the heavenly kingdom, not the earthly kingdom. Now again, does that mean be good, loyal subjects of the kingdom in which we live? Absolutely. Does that mean be loyal even to the point of the laws like everybody else? Of course a Christian should be loyal within the country. And again, I know. I remember growing up in the 70s and getting into the 80s and reading the newspaper. One of my favorites. Oh, it created a bit of a commotion for a couple of days. And the anti-tax people were screaming. Did you hear the one? It was NASA was sending the space shuttle up. And it had a $600 toilet seat on it. And there were several people that were saying, I can't believe the government spending money on such crazy things. I can go to Walmart and buy you a toilet seat to put on that thing. What in the world do we need to have a $600 one of them for? And they had a special hammer that they had designed that had, I don't know, I think the thing was a thousand bucks for a hammer or something like that. You know, when you could go to, go to Home Depot and get one for what, 10 bucks, you know? I say, I'm giving my tax dollars for this. But the Christian is loyal to the government. And the government does not give tax breaks for silly reasons. They give tax breaks to try to encourage other type situations. It's not given to try to play games. I'm on the side of old Bert. I think the Christians should be loyal in their taxes 
but take the tax breaks that come to you. Take them if they're available. Um, Arizona even has a one I've never heard of until I came here. This tax break that they'll give you to put to charitable contributions for kids in private school. Here again, we can talk about whether that's good. But the government does not give, the legislators do not give tax breaks for no reason. It's calculated. It's calculated. You know why? When I was in North Carolina, it was pretty simple. We, we did research on this where I was at one time. At that time, our local elementary school, our local private elementary school, was educating kids for about $3,000 a year per kid. You know how much the local county was paying for kid, per kid for their education? About seven. The state gives the tax breaks because every kid that goes someplace else saving them seven grand. And the people that are taking care of doing it on their own are paying taxes and taking care of things on their own and hiring people to do it who are also paying taxes and they're saying we're coming out dollar ahead that way. You see what I mean? It's not just being silly and giving away for the sake of giving away, it's calculated. So when the government gives a tax break it's because they think they're calculating that they're going to come out ahead in the game. Why wouldn't I take advantage of it? To be about doing the best I can for the Lord's work. Now there's another crazy one. Let's go to a fish story. It's in Matthew chapter 17. And it's about taxes again. But it's a different type of tax. Matthew chapter 17. It's a tax story. All about taxes. Matthew chapter 17. Now when they came, now when he was... Ah, there's the trouble. You know, when it doesn't fit, there's something not right, it usually helps to have the right book usually helps to have the right book. Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. And when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And he said, oh yes. And when they had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him. What's going on here? The temple tax is a little different than the regular tax. The temple tax is not paid to the Romans. The temple tax is to pay for the upkeep of the tabernacle or the temple in Jerusalem. It is a Jewish thing, okay? Um, thing that comes in a little bit handy here. Have, have you ever, by the way, the temple tax was not required to be paid, okay? It was not required to be paid. It was voluntary. But, hey, let me be a little bit masculine here for a minute, okay? You, you ladies just kind of, you know, let me be, uh, I gotta be a little careful here. I was an old man when Jenny and I got married. I was, I was well out of college. I had been on my own for 10 years, okay, when Jenny and I got married. I had my own stuff. I had my own apartment all put together and planned and taken care of. I had my own kitchen stuff. I had my own uh, living room stuff. I had my own bedroom set. I had all that stuff, okay? Now, Jenny had been out of college a few years, so she had all that stuff too. So we basically have enough for two of what to do with everything, okay? Now, a funny thing happened along the way. It took me a long time to catch on to what was going on. I had all my own stuff. It even happened in the context of my own car. I had a car. It was amazing how within just the first couple of years, everything that I had had before we were married, we got rid of. And it was my idea. And it took me a while to go, wait a minute, what happened here? How did this happen? I had experience with this, see. A few years later, I'm pastoring in an academy church. 
And when I'm pastoring at this academy church, there was this young man who had been, he, he was the star of the football team and the basketball team and everything else. He was the one that was the, the cat's meow. He was the big man on campus for everything that happened. He was it. And he had graduated, went off to college, and his parents still lived there, so he'd come back every once in a while for vacations and stuff. So here we are, Thanksgiving, his freshman year, he's off at college, comes back for Thanksgiving, and he's got all this facial hair. He's got the big mustache and the goatee and all this stuff, you know, he's big and coming down and everything, and, and I didn't think much of it. He goes back to school, comes back for Christmas vacation, and he comes walking up to the church, and he's, he's got, he's hand in hand with this cute little special thing. And I noticed all the facial hair was gone. And I said, dude, what happened to all the, and he says, oh, I just decided, you know, that was an experience, I didn't do that. I said, yeah, I know better than that. He says, what do you mean? I said, I know how this goes. She was saying, I'm not kissing that, but you decide if you're keeping it or not. <laughs> he says, no, pastor, it didn't happen like that. No, 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 no. But she's turning green and yellow and purple as we're having this discussion. So I still kind of think there was a little discussion like that, and it was his decision, and he didn't even know what happened. <laughs> How's that happen? The temple tax. It was totally voluntary. But there was a little bit of peer pressure that you would want to be paying this to. It was for the upkeep of the temple. But the question to Peter was a trick question. Because it was also well known all through Judaism that a priest didn't pay the temple tax. Nor did a prophet. That's what's going on here when Jesus asked the question, Simon, what do you think? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from the strangers? Peter says, from the strangers. And all of a sudden, Peter goes, oh, I get it. It was a trick question because if Jesus didn't pay, then he was saying he was a prophet. And they were ready to kill him for that. And if he, if he did pay it, then they could say that he said he was not a prophet. He was a prophet. And it was a catch-22 trouble either way. And notice what Jesus does. Peter got caught by surprise and was embarrassed, and it was an em his embarrassment that was getting him when he got grabbed to say, oh, yeah, 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 we'll pay that. Of course we're... He didn't want to deal with the peer pressure. Jesus saw they had outfoxed him. In explaining to Peter what's going on, Peter is, oh, notice what Jesus did. What was Peter's profession before he became a disciple? What was his profession? He was a fisherman. Now, how did commercial fishermen fish? What did they use? Big net, catch the whole batch of them, right? Notice what Jesus says. Peter, you go down to the river and you take a hook. Now, what commercial fisherman is going to be, want to be seen with his commercial fishing buddies when he's got a pole and a hook? You go look for one fish, not the whole batch of them. You go look for that one. Can you imagine him people, you know, what are you doing with that? What are you doing? Well, I'm going looking for a fish. You're a fisherman. Get a net. Now I'm going looking for one fish. To remind Peter. A little bit of faith. Follow God's direction. And God will take care of the need. The exact amount in the first fish you catch. The exact amount to pay the temple tax for you and for me, Peter. And you can... 
carry your pole back home with your coin out of the fish's mouth and go to the temple and pay your temple tax, remembering that God took care of the problem before you even knew you had a problem. Can God take care of his people? Amen. Stay loyal. Play by the rules. Can God take care of his people? Before there's a problem that we know about, God has the answer there. George Mueller. George Mueller, you know the name? Yes. Orphanages in London. George Mueller was a, not a wealthy man. It was in the early 1800s. He was in London, and there was a problem in London that had him frustrated. Upwards to 6,000 children were in prison because the prison was the only place that the, play, the government had to deal with children that didn't have somebody to take care of them. So little kids, they dumped them off for the prison guards to take care of them. That's where they were being taken care of. And Mueller is saying, this is a problem. And then he made his mistake. You know the mistake? Somebody should. You ever heard that? Somebody should do something about this. Now, he felt mighty safe. He was just a guy with no money and no anything. He didn't even have a house, much less a house big enough to take care of a bunch of orphans. He sure didn't have the money to do anything, but somebody should. And in his devotions one morning, he was reading in his Bible, Psalm 81, 10. Open your mouth and I will fill it. Open your mouth, and I will fill it. And he said, well, Lord, I guess if you're telling me, if you'll take away, make a way, we'll do it. And he just prayed. First gift he got was one shilling. Now, you're not going to do much with one shilling. But it was an encouragement to keep him going. One of the gifts he got was one lady took all of her jewelry and gave it to him for the orphanages. And in that jewelry, there was a ring with a rock on it. And he took that ring and engraved on his mirror, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, the Lord will provide. 10,000 plus children put in orphanages because one man was praying. Because that one man believed, open your mouth and God will fill it. Does God take care of his people and take care of his needs? Faith is opening your mouth. That God will take care of his people. Be faithful. And see what God can do. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, help us to be faithful citizens representing you. But have us to have our primary focus on what can be done in your name, by you, for you, through faithful people. Help us to remember to open our mouth and to trust you to fill it, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.